So, a little bit about Andrew himself. He became the Chief Executive of Humanist UK in January 2010, after five years of coordinating Humanist UK's education and public affairs work. As a prominent spokesperson for the humanist movement, he's a frequent contributor to newspaper articles and to television and radio programs. His favourite quote on the topic, apparently, on the topic, on the topic of connections is from E. M. Forster, one of the greatest um, of, of British 20th, 20th century novelists and a member of the Advisory Council of Humanist UK from its foundation in 1963. So here's the quote. Only connect. That was the whole of her sermon. Only connect the prose and the passion, and both will be exalted, and human love will be seen at its height. Live in fragments no longer. Only connect and the beast and the monk, robbed of isolation, that is life to either will die. End of quote. <laughs> Andrew might, may or may not have more to say about that later. Um, <laughs> Andrew is a former director of the European Humanist Federation and is currently president of the International Humanist and Ethical Union and a trustee of the International Humanist Trust. He's previously served as head of the IHEU delegation to the Council of Europe in Strasbourg and has presented, represented humanist organisations in the United Nations and Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe. In other humanist roles, he served as a trustee of the Conway Hall Ethical Society, thought to be the oldest surviving three free thought organisation in the world, and as a former chair of the Gay and Lesbian Humanist Association, now called LGBT Humanists and part of Humanist UK. So, without further ado, <laughs> I'll just say that, uh, actually, uh, there is one thing I want to I say. When, <laughs> not about Andrew. When, when you're, when you're um, asking questions, and this is for the whole of the rest of the day, can people please state your name and your affiliation um, in relationship to, you know, why you're here? Uh, Andrew's going to talk on non-religious arguments against secularism. Andrew. Thank you, Pamela. You learn such a lot about yourself when you get these uh, introductions. Um, well, I'd like to, to start really by thanking uh, everyone in New Zealand, uh, New Zealand humanists and, uh, and rationalists, uh, for making us so welcome here in Auckland and also at the parliamentary reception in Wellington, which we uh, enjoyed uh, very much. I was uh, asked to speak about, uh, take a topic from this book on secularism that um, was published last year, um, and I was asked about a year ago when the topic of this conference was going to be um, the particular difficulties in promoting humanism in very non-religious societies, um, which is why I decided to give a talk on the non-religious arguments against secularism. It's not because this is a particular obsession of mine or that I think that uh, the arguments are particularly strong um, or that I'm trying to argue against secularism, as some shocked correspondents suggested before uh, the, the conference. Um, it's because I think it is an interesting question um, as to why in societies like New Zealand um, or in societies like the UK, and the UK is the most extreme example of this, where people, uh, in terms of their beliefs, in terms of their practices, in terms of their identities, are overwhelmingly non-religious, why it is in such societies that nonetheless religious establishments, religious states, uh, non-secular states can continue to persist, and not just persist, but be very, very strong. The UK um, is probably uh, in the top three non-religious societies in terms of people in the world, um, but it has the most Christian state uh, in the world in terms of its law and constitution and policy. Why is this? Um, well, secularism, um, has many definitions, so I think it's worth just rehearsing for you 
uh, the, the definition that I'm going to use. What is secularism um, in terms of politics and, and the state? A secular state has religious institutions separate from the institutions of the state. So it's a separation. But it's more than that because the secular state doesn't just keep religious and state institutions uh, separate. It actively tries to secure freedom of thought, conscience, and religion um, for its citizens, well, anyone who, who finds itself themselves within the borders of the state, um, up to, of course, the limits of the rights and freedoms of others. Um, because we can only enjoy, uh, in, a, in a liberal uh, society, our freedoms up to when they start interfering with other people's freedoms, of course. And the secular state also uh, is one that seeks not to discriminate between people um, on the basis of their religion or, or non-religious worldview, um, and as far as is possible to treat people equally on those grounds. So this is, uh, there are many definitions of secularism. This is just the one that I, I, I used in my book, but it's also um, pretty common. It's a, it's a good umbrella definition. Um, it, it draws on the work of the, of the French political scientist, Barbaro, who writes a lot about secularism, and it's pretty widely accepted as being a, a good uh, universal declaration of what this particular approach to the ordering of states, communities, nations, laws, polities uh, amounts to. So the separation, maximizing of the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, and the absence of discrimination and the treating of people with equality on grounds of their religion or belief. And secularism uh, is... I'm, I'm a terrible at PowerPoint. I don't know why it's all appearing word by word. I want it to appear all at once, but just take me, let me take you on a journey. <laughs> We're all on this journey together. There we go. OK. Um, the case for secularism um, is uh, pretty uniform uh, across time and across uh, place. I won't go into all the many secular states that have existed uh, either today in the modern world, in the West, in the East, um, or, or, or pre-modern times. Um, but pretty much the arguments that are made for secularism, both now and then and everywhere, um, are quite common. So the case for secularism um, is quite uh, homogenous. Secularists argue that it's the best way to secure freedom. Um, that you know, other sorts of state settlement uh, are less likely to uh, make people free. Secularists argue it's the best way to uh, secure fairness, and that people can't be treated fairly if uh, there is uh, you know, religious preference shown by the state. Secularists argue that it's the best way to secure peace, that if the state chooses a side in religious conflicts, religious uh, you know, disputes, debates, it inevitably leads to at least uh, civil unrest, if not war and conflict. And obviously the blood-soaked uh, soil of Europe and Asia over the centuries uh, is the evidence uh, for that claim. Secularists um, often say that secularism is, is uh, essential for modernity, for the modern state. That's not a universal argument, but if you think about the secularists of the French Revolution or of Ataturk in Turkey um, or of Nehru in India, um, they all, Nehru called secularism one of the pillars of modernity. Um, they all had this, this idea. And secularists uh, argue that it's necessary for democracy, that um, you can't be, you can't have equal citizenship, one person with another, um, if my neighbour is the same religion as the state um, and I'm not. Um, this is a particularly powerful argument in very diverse nations uh, like India, uh, again, and was a, was a great motivator for secularism there. And secularists say that as a cumulative case, um, this is, uh, these are the arguments for uh, this as the best way to order a state, for freedom, for fairness, for peace, for modernity, democracy. Well, we're not particularly interested today in the arguments for secularism. Probably most of us are completely signed up for them anyway, and we believe them, and if we want to know more about them, we can buy a very reasonably priced book, <laughs> which, will, uh, which someone's helpfully holding up for me there. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. No commission needed. Um, we're interested today in the arguments against. So, I think that this is... Oh, there we go. Good. Hold on. Oh, there's one more. <laughs> I'm, I didn't even make these slides myself, you know. <laughs> I, I couldn't even manage. Okay. Um, arguments against secularism, um, of course, often come from a religious direction. Um, and uh, the oldest argument against secularism, of course, is the theocratic argument. Um, made in the past... Um, uh, 
mostly by Christians, um, but made uh, today mostly by Muslims and almost all of the uh, states in the world today that are theocratic, apart, apart from, from the Vatican, Vatican um, which obviously is an exception, um, are Muslim. Now, the theocratic argument against secularism is not particularly very interesting. It's not particularly clever. Um, it is that there is a God. Um, he's told us what to do, and we just need to do it. Okay. That need, doesn't need to detain us uh, for more than a second to see why, if you don't believe in, 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 in that God, that's not a very good argument. So um, the theocratic argument against secularism is, uh, is quite uh, boring. <laughs> the, the arguments that really matter... Uh, I think, if we want to understand why non-secular states, even in very non-religious countries, still persist, are the non-religious arguments against secularism. And they're the ones I'm going to be talking about. Um, so I'm going to be talking about established churches, then I'm going to talk about established atheism, which is very rare, um, romantic conservatism, uh, communitarian arguments, libertarian arguments, um, and then this liberal argument against secularism, um, which uh, is often uh, called the, the myth of neutrality argument or the fake neutrality argument. Now, if we start with uh, established churches, the, the theocrat who opposes secularism um, believes that their religion is true, that everyone ought to live by it, that the state ought to be organised by it, that society ought to be organised by it. And that's how many, if not all, established churches in the world began. Um, and certainly in the Church of England, um, there was an attempt in the, in the 17th century at a sort of theocracy. And contrary to secularist arguments of the time, uh, various Church of England priests argued that you should and could, and it was possible and desirable, um, to force people to believe a certain thing, uh, to indoctrinate them and uh, to make them go to church. Um, at the time, uh, John Locke, uh, was arguing that faith couldn't be forced, and if faith couldn't be forced, um, that it was irrational for the state to uh, require faith because no one could control themselves as to their what they believed or what they didn't. But a group of uh, Church of England clergy in the 17th century said that this was not true, that faith could be forced, and if you just made people go to church, eventually it would stick. Um, and they would, uh, it, they would take to it, um, and even if they didn't, at least they could pretend uh, for the sake of others. So um, there was a, an attempt at the beginning of established churches uh, to make a theocratic case. These days, um, almost no uh, argument for an established church is made on theocratic grounds. So if you take, for example, um, uh, a country like Denmark, I know we have, give, give us a cheer if you're from Denmark, there we go, uh, a, a, a Danish dele delegation, um, or if you're uh, uh, from England, who's from England? Excellent. Yeah. Well, th these are all unfortunate people um, who uh, have to live uh, in these established church states. Um, and the established church in the churches in these countries no longer make a theocratic case for themselves uh, at all. They make a different sort of case. Um, and this is uh, the first uh, of the, of the non-religious arguments for against secularism. And it's that religion is uh, very important. Um, in the lives um, of many people. And this argument is usually made on, on, on the grounds of, uh, about uh, immigrants in Europe especially. So that uh, if, for example, uh, immigrants are coming to Europe who are Muslim or Hindu uh, or Sikh um, or you know, from, from countries where religion is incredibly important, they are more likely to be considered, consider themselves citizens of a country if that country also has a religion, even if it's not their religion. And the idea um, today that established churches promote is that by having any sort of religion um, you know, raised up uh, to the level of the state um, so that the, the, the state has the character of that religion, you make a more hospitable environment um, for people who are coming from other... And anyone who's not white is always religious, by the way, in these uh, people's, uh, in these people's arguments. Um, and you create a, uh, you create a hospitable... Uh, environment more hospitable than the nasty secularism of France, where they're always having riots and civil unrest and, and, uh, and terrorism and so on, which proves that established churches are best. Um, established church uh, advocates also uh, point to states like Turkey um, uh, or France, uh, 
um, and say, look what secularism does uh, to states. It makes um, Muslims in particular, they often argue, feel very unwelcome. Um, it leads to a sort of attempted homogenization of people. Um, it leads to things like banning visible religious uh, symbols. And here, established church advocates point to the fact that in those states in the world where there are established churches, there is generally a much higher level um, of freedom of religion and belief um, and um, of um, uh, equal treatment of people on different, uh, of different religions than there are in secular uh, states. And unfortunately, that is empirically true. Um, the, uh, largely, I think, because of other factors, because um, countries in Europe that have established churches also tend to have uh, quite long-standing liberal democratic traditions. They tend to have human rights acts. That's not because of their established churches. Often those things were opposed by um, established churches. Certainly the Church of England um, got in the way uh, in the early stages of the Human Rights Act uh, in the UK. Um, but it gives people who want to advocate for established churches a little bit um, of support uh, in their argument. Um, the, this established church argument has an advocate in the UK, uh, no less than the Queen herself, um, who gave um, a, little, a little speech uh, about this topic just a few years ago, where she said, the role of the established church is not to defend Anglicanism. I'm not going to try and do her voice. <laughs> not, not to defend Anglicanism uh, to the, not until this evening, anyway, to the exclusion of other religions. Instead, the church has a duty to protect the free practice of all faiths in this country. Gently and assuredly, the Church of England has created an environment for other faith communities, and indeed people of no faith, ah, uh, to live freely. Well, a lot of this is fudge and cant. Um, uh, and uh, really deserves uh, ignoring completely. But um, it is very popular, um, especially uh, as a sort of uh, lip service argument uh, in the mouths of people who want to defend their privilege. So, um, uh, a weak case, generally. Um, it tends to rely on other facts about the societies that have established churches, like their liberal democratic traditions, rather than anything that is directly related or, or contingent on establishment itself. Established uh, atheism is really not very popular these days. Um, it, it, it started in the, in the Soviet Union, of course, um, and there aren't many states these days that follow the, the philosophy of Karl Marx. Karl Marx, as you know, um, uh, in the 19th century, um, thought that religion was uh, a... It was, it was damaging for two reasons. Um, one, because it taught people to be satisfied with explanations that weren't true, and so it damaged the scientific temper um, in people. Um, and secondly, it taught people, especially Christianity, um, to be satisfied with inequality um, in this life because there would be a better life along in a moment um, where you wouldn't have to suffer this inequality. So it was a counter-revolutionary counter, uh, idea. Now, Marx, of course, thought that religion um, would just naturally uh, retreat um, as civilization advanced. Um, Lenin... Uh, who is the second part of Marxist Leninism, thought that it wouldn't do any harm to help it on its way. Um, and so Marxist Leninist states, like the Soviet Union, um, often practiced uh, great religious persecution, um, making them non-secular in terms of the definition that we're, that we're using uh, today, um, and established a sort of atheism. Um, countries like Albania and Cuba uh, briefly at least. Cuba was an atheist state for I think two years and two months um, and then it changed back to being a secular state again when it looked like that wasn't you know, the way that history was going. So um, uh, states that established atheism did all the same things that theocratic states um, would do. Um, it was impossible to be in government or in a position of political authority if you weren't an atheist. Um, atheism was what was taught in schools um, and, of course, this is still uh, the case um, in some countries of the world today, some quite large countries uh, of the world today um, as well. But I think a bit like uh, the established church argument, it doesn't need to detain us for too long um, because um, it's, uh, it's not very widespread. Um, it can be uh, 
uh, an argument um, that some atheists can fall into uh, quite easily. They can, uh, you know, there are there are an, there are genuine an, uh, principled anti-secularists who are who, who are non-religious, um, who think that uh, there should actually be a restriction of freedom of, of religion or belief for the sake of um, uh, human civilization. But it's not really very widespread, so we won't uh, spend any longer on it uh, than that. I think that the main arguments that are made against secularism, which are successful from non-religious people, um, are these last four. Romantic conservatism, the communitarian argument, the libertarian argument, and the myth of neutrality. So, romantic conservatism. You don't have to be a theocrat or a totalitarian uh, Marxist to deny the fairness uh, argument for secularism that we, that we rehearsed earlier. Not everyone sees the state uh, and the nation in the same way that a secularist sees the state and the nation. Now, the, the idea of secularism, that we might have equal treatment, that we might have freedom, um, that we might have a separation of political institutions, um, relies on a certain conception of the state. It assumes that human beings um, are at least quite often rational uh, actors, that we come together, um, that the basis of our political organization is a sort of social contract, that we can come to terms with each other to agree on how uh, laws uh, should be framed to govern our particular society, that we can create institutions that will do that job, and that that's what politics is, that's what a country is. But that sort of rational social contract view of what the nation is isn't what everyone's idea of what the nation is is. For some people, the nation commands loyalty not in terms of that social contract and the agreements we make with each other, but because of heritage. Um, because of heritage or tradition um, or culture. Um, and these people argue that each person is rooted in a particular society and tradition and is bound together with their fellow members of that society uh, or tradition um, by that fact and not uh, by choice um, or rational agreement. And this is the basis of the, uh, I've called it romantic conservative, but you might almost call it sort of ethnic nationalist type case against secularism. The state is not something that we have made up, that we have agreed on, that we have created. It's organic. It's a tradition that moves through time. And the people who are coming after us, our children in this tradition, are just as important as the people who are alive today, and just as important um, are the people who also went before us. This organic idea, which is fundamental to conservative ways of thinking about ethnicity and, and nationality and heritage, um, is, of course, can be, of course, profoundly anti-secular. Um, and the best uh, exemplar of this, um, in the UK at least, was the political philosopher, the conservative political philosopher Edmund Burke um, in the 18th uh, century. Um, he had been quite a supporter of the American Revolution because he thought it was a good thing for freeborn Englishmen to defend their liberties, um, but he wasn't very happy with the French Revolution, not just because they were French, but because he didn't like the idea that society could be remade, unmade. It was a step too far uh, for him. And he had this conservative view um, of what the nation uh, was. And he said the individual constitution, the individual constitution of a state is not just something you can unpick and remake by decision. The individual constitution of a state, he said, is just a clause, just one clause in the great primeval contract of eternal society. I know. Elevated language, completely empty, unfortunately, but it's, uh, <laughs> it sounds nice. Connecting the visible and invisible world according to a fixed compact sanctioned by the inviolable oath which holds all physical and all moral natures each in their appointed place. Yes, it holds everyone in their place. That's very important. Um, and this position is a non-religious position because it is distinguishable from the theocratic position. Edmund Burke didn't think that everyone in the world should be an Anglican. He just thought everyone in England should be an Anglican. <laughs> he thought that he wrote elsewhere that you know everyone in Turkey should be a Muslim. Everyone in India should be a Hindu. Uh, 
um, and he thought everyone in France should be a Catholic and a supporter in turn of, of, of the Catholic uh, monarchy. So he... I might read another quote of his, actually, just because it's so outrageous. He... <laughs> He didn't care about truth primarily. He cared about national identity and social order. And he said, this was his justification, when ancient opinions and rules of life are taken away, the loss cannot possibly be estimated. From that moment, we have no compass to govern us, nor can we know to which port we should steer. We know, and what is better, we feel, that religion is the basis of civil society and the source of all good and of all comfort. Now, um, this emotional argument is very powerful. Um, it's uh, still got lots of its power uh, in European uh, countries. Um, even in the Republic of France, a French politician like Sarkozy um, used to make this argument quite a lot for getting back to basics of, of the Catholic uh, nature of France. And of course, outside of Europe, um, it is the ruling ideology of the government party in India, for example, um, which in the same sort of way as Edmund Burke um, saw uh, Anglicanism as part of the culture and tradition and heritage of, of every person in England um, sees uh, the Indian government today, sees Hinduism um, as the natural state of every person in India. Um, so, anti-secularism on grounds of, of heritage, on grounds of tradition, on grounds of uh, conservatism. And that's a very powerful argument today. The second argument uh, I think that is a strong one in terms of its impact and, and has its effect in uh, keeping very non-religious societies, nonetheless not secular states, is this idea um, that society is a community of communities. Uh, secularism, as, as, as we've defined it today at least, depends on a certain value being ascribed to the rights of the individual. Um, secularism is associated quite often with liberal political traditions as a result. But it, it really does, you know, if, if you want to be a full-blooded supporter of a secular state of the sort that we defined at the beginning, you do have to care something about the individual human being. Um, you have to care about whether or not they have, as an individual, freedom of conscience, thought, and religion, and belief, whether they, as an individual, um, are treated equally. Now, in the same way that not everyone uh, sees societies... Uh, political institutions as rational social contracts, not everyone sees the individual as the most important uh, unit in society. Some people, and people who make this sort of community of communities argument against secularism, say, well, look, the individual doesn't exist in isolation. Every person is embedded in a network of, of relationships, um, from the family outwards to uh, the community and eventually um, the whole uh, nation. One of the most important types of community that people are in that way embedded into is a community of conviction quite often or a community of identity, a religious community. And therefore, um, the way that the state should treat society, should interact with people um, on the base, on, 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 you know, in relation to matters like freedom of conscience, freedom of thought, um, uh, belief and so on, is not at the level of the individual but at the level of the community. This is the sort of argument against secularism that gives rise then to the idea that different communities should have different schools, there should be religious schools for different um, uh, denominations, um, uh, that there should be uh, different social institutions, different trade unions, different uh, uh, hospitals, newspapers, national broadcasting uh, corporations, and so on uh, and so forth. Now, Carried to extremes, this has been the organising principle in, in, in some European constitutions in the past, for example, in Belgium and the Netherlands, um, this form of pillarisation with different confessional communities being treated equally but separately for the purposes of state um, organisation. It's not really, uh, doesn't have the same purchase in those countries that it uh, once did, um, but is still uh, the national constitution uh, of countries like Indonesia, which were heavily influenced by uh, Dutch colonization. So Indonesia has this way of organizing um, uh, communities. Um, 
So they, it, the Indonesian state officially recognizes Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Catholicism, Protestantism, and Confucianism, and you belong to one of these denominations, and for all purpose, all sorts of purposes of political organization um, and civic identity, you affiliate with um, one of those uh, denominations, and that's the way that the state is organized. Well, um, obviously this is uh, not something that secularists um, can be very happy with. Um, how can the rights of the individual be protected in those sorts of arrangements? What are the arrangements to put in place for someone to leave one category uh, or another? What about whole new uh, religious or non-religious denominations that emerge over time? You know, things, identities aren't fixed, they're always changing, there's progress in, uh, in life. Um, what about groups that aren't recognized by the state, like atheists and humanists in Indonesia, for example, who don't have um, that category uh, for themselves? And this has real practical implications. Some of you may be familiar with the case in 2012, Alexander Arn in Indonesia. I don't know how many of you read about that case. Um, I, he was uh, quite, quite involved in it. Um, Alexander Arn um, was an atheist, um, but because he lived in Indonesia and had to belong to one of these categories, he wasn't able to say that he was an atheist. So he said that he was a Muslim, um, and then he was convicted of lying. <laughs> so it was a, a, bit of a, a bit of a dilemma, to say the least. And of course, the other secularist arguments against this community of community um, uh, case are very clear. Um, although religion is important to some people, um, even to many religious people, isn't the most important thing about them, so why should it be the organizing principle of the state and so on and so forth? Nonetheless, it's, a, it's, it's an argument that has power, and especially in, in, in uh, countries that already have an established church, like in the UK, the pressure for a sort of multicultural approach like this, of having schools for Muslims, schools for Jews, because you already have schools for Christians and so on and so forth, is very, very uh, strong. Oh, dear. Oh, have I, No. This tells me something different from here, that's why. Okay, good. Right. Um, the libertarian case is pretty simple. It says that there shouldn't really be a state anyway. Um, and so, um, you know, why does it, why does it matter if uh, uh, it, it's secular or not? Um, I mean, uh, I put it on here just because it's, you know, libertarianism is having some, something of a... Uh, renaissance these days amongst people who, uh, well, amongst some people, <laughs> and um, it can, you know, it, it can be used as an argument against secularism, particularly in the United States, for example, so they would say, people would say things like, well, you know, the state shouldn't be in the business of providing schools anyway, so, you know, um, th there's almost nothing that the tiny little state, which is the libertarian dream, should be doing that would need it to be secular or not secular, because it shouldn't really be doing anything. So anyway, I put it there just for the sake of completeness, it's not, uh, there's nothing more to it than that. Any libertarians in the room? Oh, good. All right. Well, you can you can tell us afterwards about uh, about your view of the state. Um, good. Um, the myth of neutrality then I think is the most difficult argument uh, for secularists to counter. Um, and I'm assuming that we'll all have heard some version of this because it is the most popular argument against secularism. It's also the, the argument against secularism that gives humanists and other non-religious people who think about secularism the greatest difficulty and discomfort because there's quite a lot of truth in it, um, unfortunately. And it's a sophisticated case. It doesn't come from the theocratic or the nationalistic or the conservative or the libertarian opponents. It comes often from liberal critics who are in a sense, the children of secularism themselves. They, and they use the language um, that's, and the concepts that are associated with the case for secularism to make a sort of case against it. And their argument strikes um, at the very heart of secularism's most precious claims because uh, people who make this argument say that far from guaranteeing the freedoms, uh, the liberal freedoms that secularists say they value, secularism inhibits the realization of those freedoms. They say that secularism pretends to be neutral uh, and objective and disinterested, but in fact, uh, in the separation and the freedom and the equality that it insists on, it is not neutral. 
and it carries within itself all sorts of unshared, culturally specific assumptions, uh, which undermine its case uh, to be an impartial and disinterested system. So they say it implicitly favours uh, either non-religious ways of reasoning, living, and, and, and being, or specific religious ways of reasoning, living, being, over all the others. Um, because of its Western orange origins, it uh, implicitly favours Judeo-Christian ways of, of thinking uh, and being. Um, and you can sort of see that superficially this case is plausible. If someone says to you, look, you secularists say that you're neutral, but in fact, um, everything about secularism is culturally specific from, uh, the from the conceptual level right down to the practical outworkings of secularism. They have examples, these critics, that they can adduce. So, the idea that religion is something that is in principle separable from politics is not a totally shared assumption across the world. Um, the category of religion um, is not something um, that has uh, a root and analogue in every uh, civilization um, across the globe. Um, it has roots in most of them, um, but obviously in the way that it's uh, incorporated in, for example, the secular states of France and the US, it relies on a in principle division between what's God and what's Caesar's, um, which is not um, replicable all around the world necessarily. So there's a big conceptual level, you know, it does, it, is it possible to have universal ideas about the separation between public and private, the separation of religion and politics? Um, at the conceptual level, is it possible to move away from culturally specific uh, Western ideas to, to more universal ones? And then um, there are uh, the practicalities of how secularism works um, uh, in relation to specific issues which uh, people who make this myth of neutrality argument, fake neutrality argument, point to. Um, I think the best examples of this is from the early case law in the United States in the 19th century when uh, the First Amendment, which guaranteed total free exercise of religion, um, was uh, made, and people started to bring cases um, in court to say that this freedom that the Constitution gave them had been violated, and it was much used in the early years by Mormons because um, Mormons um, were often convicted of the crime of bigamy. Mormons believed um, that God wanted them, Mormon men, to marry lots of women, and what God wanted Mormon women to all marry one man. I know, but this is what they believed. And um, the law, however, outlawed bigamy, criminalized uh, any man marrying more than one woman. So Mormons went to court, individual Mormons, uh, went to court in the United States and said, how is it that the Constitution guarantees us freedom of religion, and that's what secularism guarantees to people, um, but um, when we try and do our marriages uh, according to our religion, the so-called secular law imposes a Protestant, Catholic, or you know, non-Mormon view of marriage on us. And the same argument is uh, made today in India when there are moves to secularize marriage law in India. Um, and Muslim men, it's almost always men, uh, say, why is it that polygamy uh, should be outlawed? Um, why do you want to impose, why should the secular state be allowed to impose this Hindu conception of marriage um, onto India's, India's Muslims? If the state is secular, why is it implicitly favoring one religious view of marriage um, over uh, another. So that can be, um, at least, uh, a powerful criticism of secularism uh, in principle, uh, both that it relies at the theoretical level on concepts that are not universal, um, and also that in the specific secular constitutions and laws of particular countries, it often encodes religious assumptions from uh, the majority uh, religion rather than being uh, genuinely uh, neutral or impartial. Well, um, I think that the argument against this criticism of secularism is to admit 
uh, that secularism is not neutral. I think that one of the problems, one of the mistakes that secularists make is using that word to describe this particular uh, settlement. Secularism is not neutral. The secularist position is not neutral. It carries powerful values within it. If you commit yourself to freedom of conscience, you've made a big commitment, which has not been shared by most uh, human beings or states in the history of political organization of our species. Um, if you commit yourself to equal treatment of people on different grounds of um, religion uh, or belief and a structural separation of institutions, you are committing yourself to a particular view. Um, and I think that uh, the, the, the success that the myth of neutrality argument has had um, against secularism relies to some extent on, on a confusion of secularists who, who, who want to continue to try and portray secularism as neutral instead of admitting that it is um, a particular product. And the second, I think, way of counting this argument is to say, uh, you know, we don't claim that secularism is perfect. Nothing is perfect, right? That's one thing that all humanists can agree on, is there's no such thing as perfection. Uh, it's not possible, um, certainly not in this world, and there's no other world where it might be. Um, so uh, I think what we, what we have to uh, admit is that, and then what we have to claim uh, in counter to this argument is that it's simply um, better than all the other options of how we organize um, the state. So secularism is not neutral, it's full of values, but they're positive values that uh, uh, at least most people in the world can get behind. And secularism um, isn't perfect, but it is better than the alternatives. Thank you very much. Yeah, we've only got a few minutes, I think. So, um, I'll just take one question. Oh! <laughs> that's, a, that's a big burden to put on somebody's name. <laughs> Whoever gets the microphone first. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the privilege. I'm John Perkins from the Secular Party of Australia. In your list of the attributes or the definition of secularism, I thought there was one missing, and that was truth. I think truth is an important characteristic of secularism that you know, we should be trying to advocate that over the non-truth of religions. And I'm not talking about the existence or non-existence of gods. I'm talking about the actual false falsity of the uh, historical claims of religion that all of their prophets, Adam and Eve, down to Jesus and Muhammad, actually have no historical basis, which I think is an important one in that, you know, so the truth should be uh, something that we should advocate, particularly in a world of fake news. Uh, well, I think there's two, uh, two answers to that. The first one is, well, you know, one man's truth is, a, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a liberal uh, society, I think you have to accept that there is large scope for disagreement. And the role of the state, as Thomas Jefferson said, the role of the state in uh, theological and philosophical disagreements is to ignore them. Um, and not to take any sort of side uh, in them at all, uh, but instead to operate in the space of, of, of shared uh, citizenship. So I think that, well, it's a brave political constitution that claims to know the truth. Um, and I think that uh, history demonstrates that where states have claimed to know the truth and to pursue it, um, that's ended badly for people who didn't believe the same thing as the state. Okay, well, thank you again, Anne. And Andrew will be available um, the rest of today and tomorrow if anyone's um, for the people going to the AHEU General Assembly. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, and in keeping with tradition, Andrew, I'd just like to give you this piece of power army. No, this one is uh, symbolic of giving you power to achieve. So good luck with that. <laughs> You've got a lot to achieve. You're still young. You've got time.